Hello and welcome into Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysing, my partner, Malik Hill. We're already to the middle of April. It's about to be Easter weekend. And the NBA playoffs are just starting. We had the play-in game, the first set of play-in games uh, last night. Tonight, there will be two more. And then we get into the playoffs this weekend. So we're going to talk about those. We will also be talking about a little bit of the NFL. There's a couple quick tidbits that we got to get to. And then we're going to talk um, some Lions draft ideas. What we want to see the Lions do and kind of our hopes for the draft that's coming up at the end of the month. And then next week, we'll probably go over some of the top picks, some of the sleeper picks. And then the day before the draft, we'll do our own little first round mock draft. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So, had the play-in games last night. And first game was Cavs-Nets. And for a while, it looks like the Nets were just going to run away with the game. And the Cavs kind of hung in there. They looked pretty good. Um... They will have another chance on Friday to make the eighth seed. They're going to play the loser of Hawks and Hornets tonight. Um, Malik, what did you see out of Nets and Cavs last night? I I did not. Um, I underestimated Ramadan Kyrie Irving. He has a different strength than him right now. You forgot about that one. And he was perfect through three quarters, and it was like he was just levitating around. And mm-hmm. I saw a point someone made on Twitter last night, which NBA Twitter is so toxic and ridiculous. It's There are like maybe one or two good points in between a bunch of chaos and nonsense. Mm-hmm. But somebody made a good point saying, like, Kyrie Irving doesn't get his credit for being one of the one of the best scorers that doesn't need – like, he doesn't need to go to the free throw line several times a game to be a top scorer. Like James Harden's and mm-hmm. other players over the past few years who have constructed their game to be able to shoot like 10, 11 free throws a game at least. Right. Kyrie just gets it off of skill, and th- that's it. Mm-hmm. Him, just him being one of the most skilled players ever gets him consistent buckets. And when he's on, he's almost unstoppable. Mm-hmm. There were plays where he got jumpers off in the paint and had to double clutch and it was all in net. His finishing around the rim has always been crazy, but it's gotten better over time. His handle is unstoppable. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when he's in a rhythm, I just, I just, there's no way to stop him. And through those first three quarters, he was completely unstoppable. Cleveland had a plan on defense to where it seemed like they were trying to shut out KD and Kyrie Mm -hmm. and they wanted Bruce Brown and whoever else was on the court to beat them. Bruce Brown had a great game, so that plan didn't really work out. Yep. He got open in the paint several times. Nicholas Claxton got a bunch of lobs in the second half. So, yeah, the defensive strategy from Bickerstaff didn't work out very well. KD and Kyrie did their jobs. And it, it honestly, even though Cleveland came back a few times in the second half, it still seemed like Brooklyn kind of cruised to the win. Yeah. It seemed like they never really were afraid even when they had their stretches where they turned the ball over and Cleveland came back. Mm-hmm. Darius Garland did everything he could to win them this game. He was a star. Yeah, Evan Mobley had his moments where he looked like he was clearly a rookie and wasn't ready for this. Mm-hmm. Kevin Love looked like he was ready, and Laurie Markkinen had his moments too, which I was impressed to see him have some nice plays in this one. But, yeah, Brooklyn, they just they were in control of it for pretty much like from start to finish, Yeah, even though Cleveland tried their hardest. Right, and even, I mean, the Nets won, like, I would have expected Seth Curry to, to do something in this game, and he did nothing. Yeah, I, I put couldn't a bet on him to hit some threes, and it it didn't happen. Yeah, <laughs> it he couldn't hit happen. He couldn't hit anything. It also, it looked like he was kind of like, I don't know if it looked like he had a bum ankle. It looked like he couldn't really run full speed. Hmm. I don't know if that affected his shot, but he had almost all of his shots bounced in and out. Yeah. So, yeah, he, he just couldn't get it going. And then I think uh, kind of the cool thing for me um, on the Cleveland side was seeing that lineup when Rondo and Kevin Love came in, and it actually felt like they gave Cleveland some juice. Um, Some guys that have been there, we always know that there's a little playoff Rondo um, intrigue. He didn't shoot the ball that well, but he's not not known for that. Um, But he gave a big enough spark, 
And like you said, Kevin Love looked ready to go, knocked down a couple of big shots, and it kind of helped them get over their little their laps that they had. Um, yeah, going in in, going into the <clears throat> half, he had 11 and 6 rebounds, so yeah. he was locked in. Right. Um, Karis LeVert, he did all right overall. Couldn't shoot all that great. Four he's still, of 12. It seems like he's, he's still trying to find his fit in the offense. Yeah. Because he's, um, he's only been back for – not very long, yeah. like three weeks. But he made some great defensive plays. Um, I mean, he had seven rebounds, seven assists. But, yeah. I think, I, I think they have a decision to make on Isaac Okoro. Hmm. Because his jumper isn't reliable. He's a good defender. But I, I don't think he can be a, like a really good 3 and D guy. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he'll ever be like shut down on defense. I don't think he's good enough in one area for them to like – are they keeping Colin Sexton or not? That's I was going to say. I was going to bring up that. Because if they want to keep him, I don't think you keep a Coro. That's Because you have Karis LeVert. Yes. Now that they have LeVert, LeVert could move to the three. You could play Darius Garland and Colin Sexton exactly. in the backcourt. Yeah, I, I think that would be the more likely option. Maybe you just bring a Coro off the bench. Yeah. And I think that's where he would be more comfortable. Um, But it, it's hard to say, I guess. Because they also have Chetty Osman, who's... Actually, you know, he's been around for a while. He also didn't shoot very well in this game, but I would say he's more reliable on average um, than Okoro. And, I mean, their midseason pickup of, of marketing, you know, wasn't – he he looked all right, and maybe he's kind of in the same uh, boat as Karis LeVert where he's still trying to figure out where he fits next to Evan Mobley because he's, like, Mobley is their big guy that well, they got in the draft. When they traded for him, we thought it wasn't – it didn't make sense. But then they started him at the three, and it actually kind of worked. Yeah, I thought it was fun to see them do – I mean, it was only for a couple of minutes. They did uh, Markinen, Mobley, and Kevin Love in a lineup yeah. for a while. And I like those kind of lineups. I think more teams should try to should try to do that sometimes. But, yeah, I think the Nets are just too, too good. We got to see uh, three former Pistons on that team. I mean, Blake Griffin didn't play, but he's on the team. Uh, Bruce Brown, add him to the list of Pistons that got away. Um, Even though I, I think if he went anywhere else, I don't think he'd have the career he's having right now. Potentially, yeah. I, I don't. He's playing the four position. Yeah. He's like six three. He's like a really. He's even more unnatural Draymond than Draymond. Yeah, I, I don't know what other team would have had this vision for Bruce Brown because mm-hmm. he just fell into the perfect situation yeah and a team with a perfect vision for what he can be Mm -hmm. yeah um so any i mean now brooklyn's gonna have to face um they playing the bucks they're playing boston oh they're playing boston you're right katie and Kyrie versus tatum and brown round one (laughs) unfortunate for the celtics is it the celtics are a better team right now yeah they just have to hope katie and Kyrie don't go nuclear every game but the celtics have to have tatum and brown yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that I yeah. mean that'll be a fun one. There are four different players that can go for forty at, in any game, yeah, which is incredible for us all to watch, right? Um, and yeah. then the nightcap, kind of the more exciting game, I would say, uh, Clippers and Timberwolves. Been a long time since we've seen the Timberwolves in any sort of playoff capacity. It felt weird, yeah, because I I barely remember the Jimmy Butler year when they made the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Like this, this seemed really like different. Yeah, this seemed really different. Yep, and they were able to knock off the Clippers, one hundred nine to one hundred four. So they are in the playoffs now, and they had to make a pretty sizable comeback in the fourth quarter um, to pull this one off. Um, I think the biggest surprise for me, I mean. I think it's D'Angelo Russell. As as much as Carl yeah. Anthony Towns struggled, he was in foul trouble, so that kind of played into it. The the fouls also weren't smart. I think that no. adds to how bad the night was for Carl Anthony Towns. Yeah. But D'Angelo Russell just coming up clutch in so many situations. And then of course, I mean, Anthony Edwards, that guy I, I haven't really been able to watch him in person because I hadn't had cable for a long time. And then of course it's a Timberwolves, so how often you get to see them on TV? He was just blown by people constantly. He has a body type that you don't see in the NBA often. Yeah. He's 6'4", 
almost six five, and he's every he's every bit of almost two hundred thirty pounds. Mm-hmm. But there's no fat. Yeah, it is all muscle and bounce and quickness and speed. Yeah, like he he has an Olympic, like NFL, all time gift body, mm-hmm. and he has no fear. He's he's still figuring out the game. He has no polish to his game yet. Yeah. That's what's terrifying. He is playing off of off of pure talent and instinct and athleticism. Mm-hmm. And he goes five of eleven from three, ten of twenty one from the field, thirty points, mm-hmm. and comes up big in the in the clutch. Yep. Like he is, his future is is terrifying. Mm-hmm. He's only twenty one. Yeah. Um, and then I mean, I don't know, like. This Timberwolves team was fun to watch. Just, uh, I mean, you got Patrick Beverly. He's always got something to say or anything. He made some key plays in the game to win it, especially that steal yeah, on Reggie pocket. Jackson. To, yeah, <laughs> Reggie Jackson, game. which is great. Um, I think the weird thing for me for the Clippers was that, like, they did not seem to get the most out of their other guys. Like, obviously, Paul George is kind of their key contributor. He had a pretty good game. Um, She shot 10 of 24, 6 of 12 from the three, which was nice. 34 points, 7 rebounds, 5 assists. But, like, nobody else really, to me, stepped up. I know Reggie Jackson had a pretty solid game of 17. Norman Powell did what he was supposed to do. He had Norman Powell had 16 and uh, three rebounds. Yeah. Nicholas Batum only got, like, he only took six shots, but he's not supposed to take that many shots. And Marcus Morris, I mean, he's he's a good shooter on and off. Like, yeah. the lineups they have, what what are you supposed to get out of these guys? Um, like, unless you expect Marcus Morris to hit six threes out of nowhere. I think, to me personally, I think... Maybe Robert Covington, maybe. I, I was going to say, I feel like they should have played Covington more than Batum at this point. I think they should have played Terrence Mann more. Yeah, that he only too. played 15 minutes. That yeah. too. Like you saw a lot down the stretch. Covington, Powell, Hartenstein, Terrence Mann, even Amir Coffee, they all played meaningful minutes down the stretch of the season where I think I don't know. I know it's playoff basketball, so you're shorten your lineups, but I just think Batum's at the end of his career. Like I know he's like a solid guy to have on a team. He's bounced around a lot of places. I've always liked him as a player, but I don't know. Just watching him out there didn't seem like he did a whole lot. Not having Luke Kennard hurts too. Yeah, because he's your best shooter. That's true. That is true. Um, yeah, and, they're they're just they're missing key guys. And Zubac kind of got in foul trouble, so yeah, I don't know. Then they're they're playing small ball, and that's just that's tough. So anyway, the Timberwolves they're going to move on, and they are going to play Memphis. Big win for the Timberwolves. I am really happy for that fan base. And the fact that it honestly, it took a long time for them to get back to this, but Mm -hmm. in the timeline of the plan they've had in the past few years, like two years ago you trade for D'Angelo Russell. Last year you you draft Anthony Edwards. You sign Patrick Beverly over the summer. You get all these scrappy young guys like Jared Vanderbilt, uh, Okogie, Jalen McDaniels, Naz Reed. Mm Mm-hmm. All these things happened within the past two, three years. Yeah. So they they seem to figure things out really quickly. Yeah. Also bringing in A Rod for ownership, which I don't, I don't. He he was excited. Yeah. He was really excited out there. You had a you had a lady try to glue her hand to the court. Yeah, it was wild. It was it was a great night in Minnesota. Minnesota, welcome back. Yeah. Those fans went crazy. Yeah. So. Sorry for sorry for Sacramento. <laughs> yeah, like still down in the dumps. I said it in our uh, group chat last night. Uh, Timberwolves, they got their NBA uh, card back. Sacramento, you're on the chopping block. Now just move Minnesota to the east. <laughs> True. Give them an even better chance in the future. Yeah. Bring in Vegas and Seattle. I'm ready. You'd also it. have to add another eastern team too, but yeah. you, you know where I'm getting. We'll figure yeah. it out. Um, so now tonight we got the Hornets and the Hawks, and then the nightcap is Spurs and Pelicans. Hornets and the Hawks is really interesting. Two very young teams. Um two of the great young guards in the league, Trey Young and LaMelo Ball. I don't really know how to pick this game because, like, right away, just thinking about it off the top of my head, I think Hornets. But then I realized 
The Atlanta Hawks made it to the Eastern Conference Finals last year, basically behind Trey Young. And he's having an even better year than he had last year. Yeah. So can he do it again? Can he carry these Hawks? Because I think he's still going to have to carry them somewhat. I think there's no way. Now there is, I mean, there is my guy Kevin Herter. He also stepped up in the playoffs last year. Yes. There's a chance. There but, is. I don't think there's a way the Hornets stop Trey Young. Yeah. I don't. I just don't. I don't see it. But also, I think this this game and these playoffs are both. I don't know what this means for the Hornets. <laughs> and when I say that, is Miles Bridges coming back? What are you doing with Terry Rozier? Gordon Hayward can't stay healthy. Mm-hmm. What are you doing with PJ Washington? There are so many question marks. If like, even if you play well in these playoffs, what does it mean for next year? Are they for real going after Russell Westbrook? <laughs> that too. <laughs> I, I'm I'm happy and not happy you brought that up because I kind of got it out of my mind. Yeah. Less Russ talk, the better. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like, do you do you feel the way I feel? Like, I don't I don't know what to feel about this team in this game, in the playoffs, or going into next season. Like Lamelo Ball is the one thing with the one shining thing with this team. Yeah. But, but like you said, like, and I, I've heard it on some other broadcasts and stuff, is that, you know, if they keep, if they end up keeping Terry Rozier, like, he's holding LaMelo Ball back because Rozier's a scorer. He likes the ball in his hands. He's a good player, but that's leaving yeah. LaMelo to be more of a facilitator, which he is very good at. But there's a lot of people that expect that LaMelo can do even more than that for this team. Exactly. So, yeah, they, they got a lot of big question marks. And it probably predicates somewhat on this game, honestly, because if they don't if they don't win this game and then they lose um, to the Cavs, then they're out. And a lot of people thought this team could do something this year. And then next year they they might have to do a pseudo rebuild thing. Uh, similar it'd be, to it'd be more more of a retool than a rebuild. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say it'd be more like what Portland says they're trying to do. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It's hard to say because I I think, like, the Hornets are scary because, like, they got Rozier that can score 30. They got LaMelo that could score 30. Gordon Hayward, if he figures something out, he can always put in 25. But he you can't depend on him no, being I know. there. That's the thing. But yeah. they also have Kelly Oubre who can score 30. Like, like every, every, like, 15th just, game he goes for 30-plus. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's also – there's so much unpredictable with this team. That's another thing. Yeah. You don't know what team is going to show up from one night to the next. Right. Like, when Gordon Hayward went down in the season, they plummeted for a while. Mm-hmm. And then they went back up, and they've been up and down ever since. Yeah. And now they're they're at this weird crossroad. And you, like, you brought up the Terry Rozier thing. The If they had Gordon Hayward, I might pick them to win this game. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I just I, I have no idea with this Hornets team. I I also did forget that the Hawks have gotten Gallinari back. He's been healthy. He's been playing pretty good late in the season. So my concern originally was Atlanta's depth, which has been a strong suit for them the last couple of years. But I guess they'll be okay depth wise. So maybe that's not really a problem. I don't know. I just. I'm not sure. Yeah. This uh, game's weird. Another thing, people don't think James Borrego will be their coach next year. Yeah. They think he's somewhat holding LaMelo back and not putting people in the best position. So, will this be some of James Borrego's last few games? There's there's so much unknown with this team mm-hmm. that I, I just I just don't trust. I trust LaMelo. I know Terry Rozier is a good player and can go off. I trust what Miles Bridges has become. Mm-hmm. But I I don't know what to believe in them like from game to game. I don't really trust their defense, so I don't believe that they can stop Trey Young. Yeah. And yeah, like you said, Kevin Herter, they have other options in terms of shooters. They have other playmakers. I just I trust Atlanta more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean this is a pretty a pretty big game for both teams because if the Hawks don't make the playoffs, it's yeah. that's a whole nother thing. Yeah. Um, so let's get to the Spurs and the Pelicans. Some would call this a snooze fest. <laughs> yeah. But I'm a basketball. I'm not an NBA lover like I used to when I was younger, but I'm still a basketball lover. Mm-hmm. And I'm invested in these young players and the plans that they're building with both of these teams. Yeah. And this game should be interesting. Um, 
again, it's two teams that people don't really see a whole lot. We would have seen the Pelicans a lot more if Zion played, yeah. but uh, that's a whole other story. Um, but DeJounte Murray has had – he had a historic season, actually, because he was the first player to average, like, 20 uh, – so many rebounds, so many assists, and so many steals or something. Um, he set some certain record that – For the Spurs? I think it's the NBA or something, but well, his stat line isn't historic. Yeah, twenty twenty one points, eight rebounds, nine assists, high level stat line for a player his age, and honestly, maybe one of the best individual seasons in Spurs history. Yeah, like there there haven't been many players that put together a like complete season like he has outside of Tim and mm-hmm. Tony. Never had a Tony Parker never had a big statistical season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm curious how these guys are gonna attack um, the Pelicans because you think the Spurs have any chance? Let me ask that question. Not first. really. Okay. Um, because I, I felt like the Pelicans kind of got into a little bit of a groove, and they also had a really tough schedule to end the season. Yeah. Um, for the most part, they built some confidence. So, I, I just think in this scenario, like, if you just go through like the starting lineups, like. McCollum, Ingram, Valanchunas, like I, the top three for the Pelicans compared to the top three for the Spurs. Yeah, on paper, yes, yeah, not it doesn't match up. I just I don't see it. Yeah, even though I think a few of the matchups I think are more interesting than people think. The center matchup between Valanchunas and Jakob Pertl, people do not realize how good of a season Jakob Pertl's had. Mm-hmm. He has averages of 14 points, nine rebounds, three assists, and a block. Mm-hmm. That's a really good season for a young center that's yep. not dependent on to to be like a scorer and to do a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. And Giannis, Jonas Valanciunas has come into his own as an overall really good player. Right. Then Kelton Johnson, I've been a fan of him for a while. You know, Devin Vassell has improved. You don't know what you're going to get out of Lonnie Walker. And the rest of the roster is a crapshoot. So, yeah. I would go with the Pelicans in this one most likely, even though I like the players the Pel- the Spurs have and I like some of the matchups. Yeah. The only th- the only exception I would say is that um towards the end of the season, um the Spurs did get Zach Collins, who's been injured for like the last 2 years or whatever. He's a solid defensive player. Um, Trey Jones played pretty solid for them down the stretch of the season. So, like, their bench is better than it would have been, I think, in a lot of scenarios. So, there, there there's a small chance, but, yeah, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tough. No. Uh, I I would pick, pick the Pelicans to move on, um, but that's just me. So, then on Friday, it'll be – Whoever wins those games will play in the eighth seed game. I think I said it wrong earlier. Um, so the winner of tonight's games will play on Friday. Um, Hornets and Hawks, winner of that will play the Cavs. Um, winner of Spurs and Pelicans will play the Clippers. Good luck. For that final spot. You mean the winner of the Spurs and the – you mean the – yeah, yeah. yeah that, you said the right thing. Yeah. I, I think I said up. it wrong earlier is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so do you think – those teams have a chance to make it to the eighth seed. Um, so, like, if are you on the perception that if the Hornets won tonight, would they lose to the Cavs on Friday? I think they probably would. But if the Hawks made it for Friday, you think they would win against the Cavs? Yes. Okay. Actually, or at least have a I don't know. The, the Hornets and Cavs would be a real toss up. Mm. It really would. Because the, the, the Hornets have more options of guys that can just go off. Mm-hmm. So, okay, yeah, I'm not sure. Not yeah. sure about that one. And then if the Spurs miraculously pass by the Pelicans, Clippers, 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 yeah. Do you think the Pelicans had a chance? Have a chance against the Clippers? I think they do. I honestly think they do. I don't know if I'd pick them to do it. They would need McCollum and Ingram to, to be on. Yeah, basically. Okay, interesting. All righty, let's talk about the weekend matchups, talk about the the actual playoff matchups 
that we got going. Um, Jazz and Mavericks, that's the first matchup that we have. A lot of people would probably call this the least interesting series of the first round, but yeah, the Jazz are kind of yeah. the Jazz are kind of limping into the playoffs. Mavericks are actually on an upward trend. The uh, Spencer Dinwiddie trade had worked out really well, actually. Um, they're playing well. I, I think I would also go with the favorite in this one. I think the Mavericks would be able to beat the Jazz pretty easily. I, I think the Jazz are just going in the wrong direction. Yeah, I think the Mavericks have a chance to make a, the Western Conference Finals. That's kind of so, bold. I, I think they're one of those teams that could surprise because Luka's going to be on. He's going to play his game. Mm-hmm. And the rest of the team, they're, the whole team is just playing on a real high level right now. Yeah, And Jason Kidd has done an amazing job. Better than everybody expected, so I, I, I have faith in this Mavericks team to to win this series. Yeah, honestly, it's a lot of changes coming in Utah next year, a lot. Um, and then we have the Timberwolves and the Grizzlies. Like we said earlier, some people are excited about the Timberwolves making it in the playoffs, but they got to face one of the quickest rising teams in the league. And the Grizzlies. Honestly, in, in maybe in like the past 20 years. Yeah. A team that just went from, okay, solid young team to one mm-hmm. of the best teams in the league within a minute. Right. Yeah, the Grizzlies, I mean, they, they're a notorious team to be in the playoffs. We've seen them year in and year out. And then they had that mini slump a couple of years ago as they were kind of rebuilding. And, yeah, it's been a quick turnaround. And they're they're right there at the two seed now. And they're young, gritty, fun to watch. I don't really see it. Like we said earlier, unless the Timberwolves, like D'Angelo Russell, Anthony Edwards, and Carl Anthony Towns just stay hot, um, I don't see them winning. But I think the Timberwolves, like talent-wise, could keep up. Yeah, they, there's a scenario where they pull out two games. Mm-hmm. But honestly, I think the biggest mismatch in this is coaching. Yeah, Chris Finch has done a really good job with the Timberwolves, but Taylor Jenkins has just been on a completely different planet this year. Twenty and two without Ja. Yeah, they've been a plug and play team. Whoever they throw in has just balled out. Santi Aldama, <laughs> who they drafted out of Loyola, Maryland, <laughs> mm-hmm. last year, has had a bunch of highlight plays during the last week of the season, and they they've just every move they made it just has been great. Yeah, coaching has been great. Chris Finch, him letting Carl Anthony Towns and and Anthony Edwards get those fouls in the first half, Mm -hmm. I think showed his inexperience in these big moments. Yeah. And I think I'll have a few more learning moments in in the series. And I think John Morant will torment Pat Bev like Luka Doncic did last (laughs) year. (laughs) Yeah. This is, honestly, I think one of the more intriguing first-round matchups um, just because it's a couple couple of young teams that – have something to prove, I think, yeah. a little bit. Um, and then we get into the Eastern Conference, uh, Raptors and Sixers. This is a really fun one. This is one that a lot of people are starting to call upset alert, which, again, that usually starts to tell me that it's probably not going to be an upset. Um, but there is concern about James Harden, whether he's going to figure it out or not. If he figures yeah. it out, the Sixers should win this series no, like pretty easily because – Joel Embiid is playing out of his mind. I feel like he he just can't do wrong right now. He solidified the scoring title this year, which is the first time a center's done that since Shaq, um, averaging over 30 points a game, which is incredible. And, yeah, I don't know. I I think the Raptors have better depth in this game or in this matchup, but obviously the star power goes with the Sixers. And... I don't know. The Raptors have a chance because Pascal Siakam has kind of gotten back to himself and Fred Van Vliet has been great, but it's going to be real hard. Like I said, if James Harden figures it out, it's going to be real hard for the Raptors. Of all the first round matchups for the Sixers, this is the toughest, which is why I understand the upset picks because they have multiple guys to throw at James Harden. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, you could throw Scotty Barnes on him, and he's going to make it tough for James. You throw OG Ananobi on him when Scotty Barnes gets tired, yep. and he's going to make it tough. Like, you you have so many long athletic dudes that can just defend at a high level. 
Yeah. To make it even harder than for James than it's like been lately. Because mm-hmm. even when there's like not high level defenders on him, he struggled in Detroit. Yeah. And Detroit beat them here. Mm-hmm. Like against lesser teams, he's still been struggling. So against higher level defenders in a seven game series, plus James has proven that he he tends to fall off in play in playoff series when it gets like tighter and more tough. Yeah. I don't know if I can trust him in the series. Right. This could be seven games. Mm-hmm. Although, I'm going to say it's probably Philly and six just because Joel Embiid is just too good. Yeah. Though, he, he does have to prove that he can last through seven-game series yeah. and, make, and make it through fourth quarters because last year he just couldn't stand up through full games and just his stamina couldn't last to the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. So Tyrese Maxey is going to have to continue his improvement. Tobias Harris is going to have to do something. Yeah. <laughs> something. I was going to say, there's actually quite a lot of pressure on that third guy, whether yes. it be Tobias Harris or Tyrese Maxey. It's like, it's become Maxey, honestly. Yeah. But one of those guys, they're going to have to step up big time. And, I mean, I would expect more likely to be Tobias, but Tyrese might have to be ready to, to step up, even though he's the younger guy. Yeah. At this point, I've lost all faith in Danny Green, so I don't expect him to do anything meaningful. Mm-hmm. Maybe he hits some key threes. Let's see. Yeah, outside of that, who else are you fully dependent on for Philly? And DeAndre Jordan is the backup center. And I yeah. don't know. I haven't seen. Oh, there it is. Um, so a key factor in this game as well is that Matisse Thibel is unable to play in Toronto. Um, because of his vaccine status and the way that it works over in Canada. So whenever they're playing in Toronto, they will be without Matisse Thibel, who is their best defensive player. And It's going to be a lot of George Niang, and I don't think that's good for for this series. Yeah. It's not. So Could this go seven? I think it could. This could. Because I, I feel like Toronto's condensed playoff lineup is a little bit better than the Sixers. And if it goes seven, I think I might take Toronto. Because yeah. at that point, what does Joel Embiid have left? Mm-hmm. At that point, you have to depend on what James, James Harden. What does James Harden have left? You'll have to depend on James series. Harden to become something that he's never been, mm-hmm. which is a game seven finisher. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That so. This series has a lot of fun, crazy implications. And then the last game of the Saturday night, Saturday games, Nuggets and Warriors. Steph Curry's supposed to be back, but it's not 100% sure yet. So, could make this series very interesting. Um, and to see, like, how ready he's, you know, able to go. But, I mean, I think that the Warriors should win this game. Just, I, I think Clay is getting going at the right time. But I don't know. The Nuggets, as much as I don't think that they're a great team and that they struggle at times. They have Jokic. They have the best player on the floor <laughs> they, in this game. They have Jokic, man. Yeah. And so the, some of the things that he can do are just crazy. And then, I mean, Bones Highland has been great. Uh, DeMarcus Cousins has been solid at times. He's been a revelation for them at backup center. Yeah. Whenever he comes in, he he makes it happen. So that was a really great signing. Like Aaron Gordon's been solid. They got, I mean, they, they've been there. And so there, I don't know. There's a chance. I think on paper though, I would go with the Warriors just because this is the playoffs. I think the Warriors are a better defensive team. And if even if Curry doesn't play, we've seen Jordan Poole have really big games. Um, I think this is where Draymond Green will step up um, a little bit more is now that we're in the playoffs. And, yeah, I I just think the Warriors are that that deeper team. I just – I want to see what Nikola Jokic does to this team, honestly. Mm -hmm. I want to see these stat lines. They don't have a good – the Warriors don't have a good matchup for him. No no, no team really does, but this is really bad because Kevon Looney doesn't have a chance. And Draymond, he can try, but – Nothing he does will really have an effect on Jokic. Yeah. He'll maybe get a few stops. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, it's a really interesting matchup. Yeah. And then 
the Suns. Oh wait, sorry. The Heat. Two teams with uh, flames. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Good try. The top two seeds. Good attempt. The top two seeds are very, uh, very similar. Um, the Heat are going to play whoever gets that eight spot, whether it be the Cavs um, or the Hornets slash Hawks. I don't see the Heat having a problem with any of those teams. Um, if they, if it ends up being the Hawks, it'll be a challenge with Trey. But the Heat, they're they're just a stronger team. Yeah, and, I, and Kyle Lowry will, are, will kind of make it tough on yeah. Trey. And I was gonna say they also have Jimmy Butler. So again, you step up on defense in the playoffs. That'll I think that'll help the the Heat. Yeah, and PJ Tucker. They're they're just they're so tough. Yeah, and they built this roster for Bam, the playoffs. Bam as well. Yeah, yeah, they're gonna be good. And then they got lethal shooters off the bench as well. So they're they're destined to make a run. Yeah. Then we got the Nets and Celtics, which we already kind of hinted yeah. about. I can't wait to see this game. It could be crazy. Could be really close. Um, I don't know. I, Prediction: I don't, Who goes for forty first? Is it Tatum because he's at home, or do KD or Kyrie just come in and light it up? Who who goes off first? I don't know. My original thought would be KD, but the way Kyrie has played recently, just seems like he might be on another level yeah. right now. Um, it could be two guys going off. Yeah. I think the scary thing for for the Celtics though is that well, I guess they got Marcus Smart, so they have the better defense. That's the advantage they have. Yeah. Well, I I just started thinking that the Celtic like Jalen Brown might have to sacrifice too much on defense where that his shot isn't falling as much. Oh no, yeah, they have Marcus. It'll so. Marcus is gonna chase Kyrie around. It Kyrie will still get his numbers, but when it comes to superstars, as you know, a defender's a defender's responsibility is making it tough right. on a star. Yeah. They're going to get buckets no matter what. It's just when they get the buckets and how. Yeah. So we'll have to wait and see see how that goes. Um, my prediction, I think, is still the Nets, but maybe I'm just discounting the Celtics because they've been so up yeah. and down. But they I, finished, they I didn't so believe strong. in them until like this last month of the season when I I didn't realize they had the number one defense in the league. Mm-hmm. And I watched them a few times. Marcus Smart is really like playing high level point guard. Like he's he's making great decisions on offense. Mm-hmm. He's not just jacking threes at random moments. His defensive impact has been the highest it's ever been. Cause he he has like defensive highlight plays like three or four times a game. He's playing the best he's ever played. Not having Robert Williams hurts. Yeah. For this first round, they could win without him. But they'll need Robert Williams eventually if they want to make a run. Mm-hmm. But Grant Williams has been a high-level defender. Al Horford still can do his job. Right. They have what it takes to beat Brooklyn, mm-hmm. especially without Ben Simmons. They they have what it takes. Yeah. Should be a fun series. Bulls and Bucks. I think we both say there's there's no way the Bulls win this series. Man, this could there's have no been way. if Lonzo was there. Yeah. There would be a chance. This Bulls season looked so good at the beginning, yeah. and it just kind of fell apart a injuries. little bit. Yeah, injuries are always going to hurt you. Now, I will say they have a chance to steal a couple. Yeah, um, I agree with that. Because of, you know, Levine, um, DeRozan, Vucevic, like, they're still very talented. And Pat Williams has been back. Yeah. He looks like himself. But they're the Bucks just have more depth. I mean, they've been there. They have Giannis. Like, what do you do with Giannis? I, I was about to say, you could stop there and just say Bucks and four, and it would make sense. Yeah. But, yeah. Drew Holiday, he's a nightmare on both sides of the court. Um, he's going to make it super tough on either DeRozan somebody. or Levine. They'll yeah. probably put him on DeRozan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, unfortunately, I do think the Bucks probably want to run away the, with this series, but. I'm going to say Bucks and five. Okay. Honestly. I think it'll be a bunch of really good games. Mm-hmm. Maybe six, but I'll I'll say five. I think most of the games will be close, but the Bucks pull it out in the fourth. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. I'm gonna go with six just because. I just you feel think like Rosen and Levine have a few big yeah, games. Yeah, I feel like somebody's gonna go for like thirty five or forty yeah. even. Um, and then final game of the weekend, Suns playing whoever. I don't think it <laughs> matters. I I'm so happy you didn't even mention the team, because if Chris Paul didn't play, they would still sweep him. Yeah. Whoever's in the eighth seed. It will be Clippers or um, Spurs or Pelicans. So 
Phoenix finished with 64 wins. Yeah. Man. They were on a tear. Um, it's crazy. Mikhail Bridges is the only player to play every single game of the season. He and he's played every game since he's been drafted. Yes. And he didn't miss a game in college. Yeah. That's Somebody crazy. give him an award. <laughs> Somebody give him, I don't know. Just Lifetime Achievement hold, Iron Man Award. Hold him hostage because that's there's a <laughs> grain of luck in there. Yeah. So Especially with his build. He's not like the strongest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Suns, they should win. So that's your first weekend of the NBA playoffs. Going to be exciting, and that'll go all the way through next week. We'll have most of the game twos, I believe. Maybe all of the game twos by next episode. Most of them, yeah. Um, so we'll get to talk about those. We'll get a better idea of um, what these teams are looking like. Um, so it's exciting times. I'm, I'm kind of excited for playoff basketball. I haven't been able to keep an eye on it too much, but now that I have cable, I can watch all the games. And, yeah, it's been fun. So let's slide on over to the NFL. A couple quick tidbits that we got. Um, Derek Carr signed a three-year, $121 million extension. <laughs> Just $121. Three-year, $121 extension. <laughs> Million-dollar extension. So he's getting paid. And, I mean, that's right in line with the Devontae Adams deal, I believe, or something like that. Um, so it makes sense. Honestly, I, do you think he deserves it? I think he does. It's hard because it's one of those scenarios where like money is so crazy these days. That yeah, that's another thing. It, it's that's kind of part of it because he's like he's not middle of the pack. He's like he's he's at the edge of the top ten. Yeah, he's like he's, middle, he's like ten eleven. He's like middle of the towards the top. It's it's kind of a weird spot. So yeah. I I give him more points because I think being a quarterback for the Raiders in the past twenty years. Is one of the hardest jobs in the world. Mm -hmm. He stepped in as a rookie, only got better, almost won the MVP, got hurt, dealt with those injuries. The team got worse, a bunch of stuff going up and down. Yeah, they hire John Gruden. It seems like everything's falling apart around John Gruden and the team, and he still leads them to the playoffs. Yeah, he does. I think he deserves it. I think the funny thing that I saw, I, I, I'm sure it was on Twitter, um, but somebody was talking about how. It's funny that, you know, the Raiders gave him all this money before, like, this is his biggest year to prove something. Because now he has weapons. There's not as many. Uh, the only excuse would be that the division is just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but he now has, like, the weapons in place that he should be able to do something. So we'll really see how good he can be um, this year. A um, couple other ones. There's a couple free agent stuff, like Tyron Matthew. OBJ still kind of out there lingering. I don't know where I saw it, and I don't really believe it, obviously, but I saw that there's some inkling that the, the Lions could go after Tyron Matthew. I heard the Cowboys were trying to go after him. Yeah, but, I, I yeah. would think that somebody contending would go after him. Um, so that's kind of a weird one. OBJ, I know a lot of people, I, I'm sure, are just nervous about the injury. Um, but I'm sure as well that somebody will take a risk at some point. And then... Baker Mayfield is still a Brown. I feel like the answer is automatic no, but do you feel bad for him at all? He's got his money. <laughs> he I got mean, that Geico money. I can't. I can't really feel bad about it because he's he's been an NFL starter for a couple of years now, and he got the Browns to the playoffs, won a playoff game. Yeah, I mean he's got and now he's the backup quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. Yeah, I just. For uh yeah, quarterback that had twenty two cases. Yeah. Twenty two cases. Speaking of which, um do you think have, have you seen the latest Cam Newton stuff? <laughs> do, do you think he's getting back in the league? Oh man. Uh, he said some very controversial things about women. Honestly, it and uh I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm just curious if he's gonna make it back in the league. I don't know if he does. Point. I don't I don't think he does. I think I think his cigar bar and his other ventures, his hats. Yeah, he's he's making a lot of money off of those. To me, he's like a more, an even more eccentric Dwight Howard. Just because of like, I feel like he's he's playful in a lot of ways. Maybe not as playful as Dwight. He voices his opinions more than Dwight. Is yeah. that what you mean by more eccentric? He's yeah. more outspoken. Yeah, 
Dwight was just jokey, jokey all the time. Right. But they're both kind of guys that are like, like really good players. But it seems like as their career has gone on, they've become more of a novelty. I could, that is actually a really good game. That's a good one. <laughs> so like, the more I think about it, yes, that makes a lot of sense. And I love Dwight Howard, yeah. but I don't know. It's just kind of how their careers have developed. Like they went from being one of the best. Like Cam Newton was an MVP. Dwight Howard was MVP candidate, defensive player of the year. And then as their careers have tailed off, they're just kind of, I mean, they're kind of hanging around. Yeah, there, there are points in their career where you're like, do you, do you remember Dwight Howard got signed by the Hawks? You remember that? Yeah. He's a year in Atlanta. Right. Does anybody – you remember that Charlotte year? Yeah. You remember that last Carolina year for – Remember when he's for, in Houston? People remember. That's the last time they really remembered yeah. Dwight. But yeah. So. It's, it's just weird. It's interesting. It's, yeah. And listen, everybody has pa- podcast platforms now. Mm-hmm. Some are a lot better than others. I really don't listen to – <laughs> what Cam yeah. has to say a lot. Sometimes he has decent points. I just happen yeah. to see it. Yeah, like J- J.J. Redick and a few other guys are like the only ones I really listen to. Yeah. The ones that are super controversial, and like that's one of the, some of the main reasons why they're known, right. I don't really listen to them. Yeah. yeah. I just I just listen to the people with really good interviews, really good insightful stuff. Yeah. Um, and then on the final note from the NFL news-wise, unfortunately, this is honestly crazy, Dwayne Haskins passed away um, this past was that was that Monday? It was. Or was it over the weekend? It was over the weekend. I think it was Sunday then. Yes, it was Sunday. Okay, so it was Sunday. Um, apparently, uh, I, the full story hasn't come out yet. Um, but he was walking on the highway and he was hit by a truck. Um, it's it's super tragic. Um, just hope for the best for Pittsburgh and I mean his family and stuff. He's He's 24 years old. Um, I still thought he was a potential, like, could be really good in the league um, for somebody to take a chance on. So it's it's crazy to see. Um, super sad news. But, um, yeah, I guess they're going to have, like, a, a ceremony thing or some sort of thing in Pittsburgh this weekend. But, yeah, very unfortunate. Yeah. His His story is the one that, a lot of people, bef- until he passed, a lot of people didn't realize, like, this is a kid that there's a video of him as a child, mm-hmm. like eight or nine years old, get- getting a tour of Ohio State. Yeah. He's walking through the locker room, and he tells his dad, I'm going to play here. Mm-hmm. And he did it. Yeah. He went to Ohio State, had one of the greatest single seasons of a quarterback in college football history. Yeah. 50 touchdowns, only like eight interceptions, just lit everything up. Mm-hmm. top pick came in and had to figure things out and still had a, had time to figure things out from everything we've heard. All of the Steelers teammates say he's, he was a great guy. A lot of people were very emotional about it. Yeah. Every, a lot of people loved him. I think that's yeah. the cool part that you realize like how good of a teammate he was and all the people just saying like how cool of a guy he was, how nice he was to hang out with and just, a stand-up guy. That's yeah. always that's always something good to hear. He he achieved things that, uh, honestly, we probably won't achieve in our lifetime. A lot of people won't achieve. <laughs> he called his shot when he was young, and he did it. Mm-hmm. And he made it to the top, and he had a chance to keep improving and get to there. But, yeah, tragic news. Yeah. Rest in peace, Dwayne Haskins. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just really sad news. Yeah. Only 24. Um. So now for the last 10 minutes or so, we want to talk about the draft because uh, we are only three, two weeks away, three weeks away. Um, so today we want to focus on what we want the Lions to do. Um, at, they have a lot of quality picks. They have the number two overall pick. They have the 32nd pick, and they also have the 34th pick. Um, so a lot of meaningful spots that they can go. Um, I just pulled up <laughs> one of the later um, NFL drafts. Uh, mock drafts that they did on NFL.com. And this is how crazy mock drafts have gotten. And this is why we haven't really been talking about yeah, a whole lot of mock drafts. It's been drafts. really out of control this um, year. They now have Trayvon Walker up to number one <laughs> going to Jacksonville. The Lions getting Aiden, Aiden Hutchinson. Um, hey, Kayvon, Trayvon Walker jumping ahead of, K- of Kayvon Thibodeau is, just seems absurd. Yeah. Kayvon Thibodeau going down to five to the Giants. 
Um, That'd be a steal for the Giants. <laughs> Sauce Gardner is one of those guys that has flown up boards. Um, he was kind of – he was like top 10 material, maybe just outside of the top 10. Now he's moving into the top five in certain places. So it's all over the place. So that's why we're just, we're just going to focus on the Lions today. Malik, what do you want to see the Lions do? Let's say with pick two, let's do just the first three picks, two, 32, and 34. Two, uh, I think three players. And let's, just go, let's also just go off of the assumption that Hutchinson is gone, that he goes number one. Unless you want to play or, it. Was, or Thibodeau. That's why, I, that's why I said three okay. three players for this pick, I think, would be very good options. Okay. And Detroit fans should be happy with it. That's either Thibodeau, Hutchinson, or Kyle Hamilton from Notre Dame. Okay. We've heard everything we've we've needed to hear about Hutchinson and Thibodeau. We watched Hutchinson all season for Michigan. Great senior season. Mm-hmm. I've said before, I don't think he has the potential to be like an all-time great pass rusher like Kayvon Thibodeau, but I think he has the potential to be a consistent 10-13 to 13 sack a season guy. Yeah. A guy that just racks up the sacks over a career. Maybe like a Kevin Green, old school pass rusher, was consistent 10 to 13 sacks a season. Mm-hmm. Ended up being top five in sacks throughout his career just from consistency. That's what I see from Aiden Hutchinson. And that's a huge thing to have for a team. Mm-hmm. So I think it would be worth the pick. Kevon Thibodeau, all the talent in the world. Freak athlete. Could be an all-time great pass rusher. Kyle Hamilton, he is one of those... I'm not going to say he's like Ed Reed or Troy Polamalu, yeah. but he's one of those leaders of the defense. Good in second, I mean, good in coverage and good coming down and hitting. Overall, high level safety with the size to go with it. He's one of those guys that could be a staple of your defense mm-hmm. for years. So I think those three would be quality picks for the Lions. What do you think? Yeah, I, I'm in agreement. Um, I like Thibodeau. A little more than Hutch. Um, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, I think, again, it for me, because this team is not ready yet, I'm okay with taking Thibodeau, who I think has the higher ceiling. Hutchinson, I think, is the, the safer pick, I guess you would say. Yeah. Um, but I think Kayvon Thibodeau in Detroit, it just fe- that just feels like a Detroit – kind of pick of like does is it feels like the impact of when Sue came. Yeah. And it, when it, him and Nick Fairley came in, it it seemed like things were really turning around. Yeah. And and Thibodeau could be one of those guys where it's like, okay, I was supposed to drop. Luckily the Lions still went with me. I've got something to prove now. I want it to be one of those scenarios because if he buys in and it's got he's got something to prove, Detroit eats that up all day. Um I mean we've seen it in little stints you know, with, with like Blake Griffin, um, Marvin Bagley. I know these are basketball, but even like, I mean, Penny Sewell seems like he's he's bought in to the Lions pretty quickly um, and, and enjoys this atmosphere. And I feel like anytime somebody just buys into Detroit, fans love it and eat it up, and it just makes the player even better. It, it's been a long time since the Lions have really had that defensive anchor. Mm-hmm. I mean, would you say Zeke Yonsa was that guy? I mean, because yeah, they, were, they, were, they were pretty average those years. Yeah. I think they made the playoffs one time with Zeke Yonsa, but mm-hmm. would you say he was kind of the, like the last one? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, He was like a fan favorite, and he was able to get to quarterbacks and things like that. So yeah, Even though he could be considered that, I, I still think back to guys like Sue. Yeah. Now, my third third guy, I, I don't know. Um. I kind of agree with you. I like Kyle Hamilton. I, a lot of people are thinking he's going to fall out of the top 10 because of his 40 time, but I think he's just an all-around good player. I also, I've said it before, I wouldn't hate Sauce Gardner. I, I'm sure Detroit would hate it um, as a pick, but this guy is, I mean, he's he's huge for a cornerback, and I, I feel like he could be an elite cornerback, and I see it, you know, even more so than uh, – why can I not think of his name? Our, Who are you thinking of? Our corner from Ohio State. Why, uh, Jeff I, Okuda. I already yeah. forgot his name. You're like me right now. When I, yeah. I, I That happens to me. But Jeff Okuda, I remember. <laughs> Jeff Okuda. Yeah. Like, 
I just feel like Sauce Gardner is the more solidified package already than Okuda was, even when we yeah. drafted him. Okuda back then felt like a safe pick. Sauce Gardner doesn't feel necessarily safe, but he feels like he could be very rewarding. Um, and I think our secondary needs it, but I, I think a lot of people wouldn't like it. So I'm, I'm kind of on the same board as you. Um, for the most part, though, as long as they don't go Malik Willis, I'm okay with anything. Me too. Even Trayvon Walker, like people just think this guy can turn into something incredible, then I'll go with it. I, I'd love to see it. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not too concerned about uh, that number two overall. Now at 32, this is where it gets interesting. Yeah. I do not want a quarterback here. We agree. There is a lot of people, quite a bit of people, even a lot of Detroit fans that I've heard want quarterback here. The the Detroit is quarterback thirsty, and I you understand. Yeah. We both understand why they're so thirsty for the guy. Mm-hmm. But – this is clearly a draft where it seems like the guy just isn't there. Yeah. There's a lot of people saying Matt Corral. I don't want it. The only quarterback that I ever said that I would take at 32 was Malik Willis. We know that's not happening now. He's he's flown up boards. He's going top 10. He's not going to be there. So at that point, I don't want to take any quarterback. Um. So for me, I just I want more defense. I want more defense. Um, I've heard people say Lewis Seen. I don't think that would be bad. Um, but you could probably also get him at 34 potentially. Um, that's the nice thing is in um, those picks between 32 and 34, you can most likely get kind of whoever you want. Um, I, I honestly also wouldn't hate getting – you know, one of the Michigan guys, maybe. Um, I think Dax Hill will probably go higher than 32. You think so? I mean, he's he's looked at as, like, one of the top two safeties. Yeah. I mean, top three after yeah. Kyle Hamilton. That's true. Um, But. And I think Dax would be more of a free safety. I think Kyle Hamilton would be more of a strong, probably. Yeah, and I know that it would also. Or who knows? Yeah, he could go all over the place. It, it would also depend, like. I don't think that, like, maybe David Ajabo falls that far because of the injury. I don't know. Um, but I'd, I'd even be okay with taking a risk on him um, at that point. Um, but I just want somebody. Somebody on the defensive side. N'Kobe Dean keeps dropping for some reason. Yeah, N'Kobe Dean. And I, if he fell to 32. See, that's the other one that I can't, I can't, I can't bring myself to bring up because I feel like, how is he dropping? That's what I keep thinking. Every time I see projections, I see N'Kobe Dean almost out of the first round. And if he fell to Detroit at 32, I feel like it'd be perfect. Man. It'd be perfect. Oh. Even if yeah. we went both the Georgia guys, Trayvon Walker and N'Kobe Dean, that'd be great. That'd be a great draft. If if we get, well, honestly, like we said, if we get any of those defensive ends plus N'Kobe Dean, I'm so happy. So happy. Um, so we're on board. Nicobe Dean falls. He's the pick. Yeah. Easy. So I understand your defensive point, but this is such a deep receiver class. And I think, I think at least five are going in the first round. Yeah. I guess that's true. At, at 33, the Jaguars may be looking at wide receiver as well. So we may have to try to jump them. Yeah. So. I think Olave will be gone. I think Drake London will be gone. Traylon Burks will be gone. Garrett Wilson. Most likely Garrett Wilson. Is that four? Four. I say Garrett Wilson, Drake London, Traylon Burks, Chris Olave. Yeah, that's four. Jamison Williams. Jamison Williams. A team might take a chance on him in the top 20. That's that's an up in the air one. Mm -hmm. That's really up in the air. But you get to the end of the first round. You got Jahan Dotson. George Pickens. You got George Pickens. A guy who I'm really interested in is Khalil Shakir from Boise State. I think he's a return monster, and I think he's the overall just really sneaky, could be like a high-level number two receiver. Mm -hmm. You got a lot of choices. You could go Justin Ross from Clemson. 
if they took David Bell right there from Purdue, I would be happy because I'm much higher. I don't know why people aren't higher on him. Yeah. He was the best receiver in the Big Ten last year. Yeah. But but Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson got all the shine because yeah. they played for Ohio State. and Yeah. I think it depends on who's there. 32 and 34 is going to be dependent on who's around. Because if Nicobe Dean, like we said, if he falls. Oh, yeah, I, then I vote Nicobe Dean. I feel like you go with him at 32. And you expect that there will be like a George Pickens, Jahan Dotson choice for Jacksonville to take. At 34, you take the other guy, potentially. I think I'm kind of on board with you, though, where probably should get receiver at 32 or 34. Would you be afraid if they took Christian Watson, the guy that's risen up everybody's boards, didn't prove it with the production at North Dakota State, but his testing numbers are just ridiculous? Would you be afraid if they took him? Not necessarily. Because, because it's a rebuild and he has so much skill. Yeah. I'm always a big fan of big receivers. I always like having a big receiver. Um, and now that we have DJ Chark, who's kind of a speed, also a big receiver. Yeah. But if Christian another, Watson, that he kind of is like DJ Chark pretty right. much. But if we got another big receiver on the other side, you get him on Ross St. Brown in the middle, that's pretty solid for me at least. Um, and then you could go Josh Reynolds, four wide receiver sets. I, I think that's yeah. that's a good play. Um, wow, we went we went overtime, which is fine. <laughs> um, we'll get more draft talk in the next episode after we go over um, playoffs. We'll be able to go through that a little bit quicker. But next week we'll try to talk talk about more of the top guys outside of those ones that the Lions are looking at. Um, we'll talk about some deeper sleepers. And, uh, yeah, we'll get into more draft talk, more NBA playoffs. But for now, this has been Views for the Sidelines. We will see you guys next time. Lions take Malik Willis, number two. In the 32nd pick, they take Sam Powell. Just a quarterback extravaganza. <laughs>